to thank you for tuning into our broadcast today. We've got another great service in store for you. Each week we are seeing new people being drawn into the presence of God. Now, when I came to faith in Christ, there were three things that caused me to follow him. First of all, I felt his presence real strong. Secondly, I saw his power at work. And finally, I heard the truth of God's word. For the past 26 years, we've been committed to seeing lives transformed through these same three principles. We need your help to bring this life-changing experience to a generation that so desperately needs a foundation of faith. Now, if our ministry has been a blessing to you, please let us know. You can contact us or partner with us through our website at libertychurchmi.com. Take a minute and check it out. Now, here's today's message. I hope you enjoy it. It's good to see you uh, this morning. Like I said, I see some new faces today. Welcome. We're thrilled that you chose to be with us this morning. We're going to continue our series today called Coping Mechanisms. It's a study in Psalm 23. So we're going to begin our journey today in Psalm 23, of course. Uh, we've worked our way through the first few verses, and uh, we're going to read this morning the fifth verse. This is really a story about shepherding and how a shepherd and sheep have a very unique and special relationship and that God calls us his sheep, and that he's our shepherd. And really this morning, we, we want to understand that David starts this psalm out by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. And in Old Testament times, they didn't really have this wonderful dynamic called the church that Jesus died to establish. The Bible says when he died and rose from the dead, he gave unto us gifts like pastors, apostles, prophets, and evangelists, and teachers. And so he set up a system called the church but in the Old Testament, their relationship was directly connected to God. And so David said, the Lord is my shepherd. And today God has set up people to shepherd you because of what Jesus did through the cross. And so we need to understand this shepherd-sheep relationship, not only as it pertains to our relationship with God, but our relationship to the church. God is the answer, yes, but he's also established a church so that he can move through people to be a great blessing to you. And so I don't want you to ever understand uh, that church is the answer, but it is one of the greatest tools that God uses to bring answers into your life. And so we encourage people to be a part of the church and get involved in the church and get connected to the church, not because church is the answer, but because we will help you to connect to God who is the answer. And so as David works his way through this psalm, one of the things that we've been talking about is the progression of a shepherd and his sheep throughout the year. They begin uh, the beginning of the year in the winter months at their home on their ranch. The springtime, they go out into the new shoots of grass that are around uh, their ranch, typically in the, in the valley regions. And then they begin to work their way up into the mountains in the summertime as they've uh, eaten all of the available grass and the pastures that lie in the valleys. And it's a little bit cooler in the mountains, but there's other challenges. And so this is what we've been talking about over the weeks. And we get to the fifth verse here. David says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. And I want you to understand, this is right on the heels of last week when we talked about you'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death and you'll fear no evil. Then he begins to talk about enemies. And that's the, the things that you would fear as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. There would be all kinds of challenges. There'd be wolves and bears and lions back uh, in their region of the world and, and uh, you know cold temperatures and falling rocks and, and desert places and very difficult landscape to navigate. And so, you know, today I want to talk to you really this coping mechanisms thing is there's a lot of people in the world that they turn to a lot of things to cope with these challenges, these dangers, these struggles, the anxieties, the pressure, the stress of life. And one of the things that I've learned is that when people are going through difficult times, they sometimes have a tendency just to not even have an appetite to eat. You can see I've not gone through a whole lot of difficulty in my life because I've not missed too many meals. But I have had some times in my life where you just get stressed out. And in my line of work, a lot of time, it's just got to do with trying to deal with people and relationships and things like that. And I've had times where I just don't feel like eating. You're just tired. It wears you out and stress like that. And so trying to cope will often leave us too restless to eat. And, you know, David went through seasons like this in his life. And you know, there were times where he traveled from place to place. There were times where Saul 
was looking to take his life. And the Bible said he'd sleep out in the plains and rocks were his pillow and he had nowhere to lay his head and he lived in caves. And sometimes he found himself even in other nations in unwelcome places or enemy territory. And he struggled to know where his next meal would come from and lived in places that none of us would ever want to live. And even when their child Bathsheba, uh, the child that Bathsheba became pregnant with, and you know some of the circumstances maybe surrounding that that were not godly circumstances. And she gave birth to that child, and the child became ill and eventually died. But during that period of the child's illness, we find in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 16 and 17, it says, David begged God to spare the child. He went without food and lay all night on the bare ground. The elders of his household pleaded with him to get up and eat with them, but he refused. And so this is one of the ways that David coped with a struggle in his life. He he laid on the floor and he wouldn't eat and he prayed and he grieved and, and he cried out to God. But through all of these things that David dealt with in his life, very difficult, challenging circumstances, and we've talked about many of them throughout this series, that David learned to cope with some of these things And he began this psalm by saying, I cope through having the Lord as my shepherd, following his leadership, giving him control, not just of of a part of my life, but every area of my life. You know, we tend to, as believers, compartmentalize our lives, and God has control of our Sunday mornings sometimes. And uh, But does God have control of every area of your life? And so this is what David was saying when he said, the Lord is my shepherd. It meant that God controls every area of my life, who I hang out with, uh, what, what kind of entertainment I involve myself in, what kind of job I have, where I live, uh, and uh, who I marry, and you know all of these things, how I spend my money. God is my shepherd. He's in control. And then he followed that up by saying, because God's in control, he's all I need. I don't lack. I don't have want. I don't have uh, some of the struggles that I used to have in my life. So this is how we cope. We have a shepherd in our life. And I want to talk to you for just a minute about the the blessings of having a shepherd. And before I do that, and and I'm trying to help you understand, I've made a couple of comments over the last few weeks that I want to backtrack and and just explain for a little bit. Um, You know, last week I I talked a little bit about uh, Bible study, and I've talked a little bit about counseling and things like that. And I'm not anti-Bible study, and I'm not anti-counseling. I've actually had people over the years that I've encouraged them to go see a counselor. I've encouraged people that get to a place where they, they are struggling enough emotionally that maybe there's a, a medical need, that there's a uh, uh, chemical imbalance that needs some medication and things like that. Those are things that God has, has designed and invented. He's gifted people and created medicine to help with those type of things. But you have to understand my heart. I have the heart of a shepherd. And I believe that just as those things are available to us, that the greatest thing that God has created in our life is the ability to get into his word and to get into his presence. And then just as those things can help, first and foremost, the Bible says that we'll seek first the kingdom of God and that we need to seek the presence of God and we need to seek the word of God. And I, I know that I hit on that a lot and I'll talk about that again this morning. The presence of the Holy Spirit and the word of God is the primary answer to these things. I'm not saying we shouldn't seek these other things. And again, I'm not against Bible studies, and we're talking about getting some of those going here now that we're through this pandemic and people are back to getting back together, and God is raising up some incredible leaders in our midst and things like that. But we need to understand that I'm a pastor, and I think that God and the spiritual resources that he's uh, availed us to are the most important, the most valuable, the most dynamic resources that we have. And so, of course, I'm going to say that, you know, get into the presence of God and get into church, and those things are, are, are really what I believe God has put in our life to be the answer to every problem and every situation and every need that we have in our life. And so that's where David said, the the Lord is my shepherd. He's all I need. And so I believe these resources should be the primary resources that we seek in our life. And Jeremiah spoke about this in Jeremiah chapter 23. In verse 4, he said, I will set up shepherds over them. Now he's speaking prophetically. This is before the establishment of the church. This is before Jesus rose from the dead and said, I'll I'll give you pastors to, to establish churches. He said, I'll set up shepherds over them who will do some things that are very important. Number one, who will feed them. And as a result of that, they'll fear no more. 
nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. And so this is what God has designed for us, to gather together as a church and as a family. And he set up shepherds over us to feed us. And so when I I was talking last week, and I'm talking about Bible studies, I'm here to feed you on Sunday morning. This is a Bible study. We're going to feed you the the, uh, amazing, powerful, life-transforming words of God. And that's what this is all about. That's what this is for. And so you've got a hunger for that word. You've got to desire the words of God that the Bible says is able to save your soul, your emotions, your thoughts. It's able to transform you and change you into what God has called you to be. And so the result of proper shepherding and being in in the right kind of a church is a church that's preaching the word of God and teaching the Bible and a shepherd that desires to feed you. And, you know, we've talked about this throughout this series. Not every shepherd is like that. You can go throughout regions, in, in especially in, in Europe and places like that, where, where you have shepherds and that are taking care of sheep. I've been reading a book in preparation for this series. And not every shepherd cares about what their pasture looks like, cares about what their sheep feed on, cares about the parasites and things that attach themselves to the, to the sheep. They only care about themselves and the money, that those sheep are just meat ready for the slaughter so they can put money in their pocket. And there are churches like that, and there are shepherds like that. But Jeremiah says, God wants to set up shepherds who will feed you, who care about your nourishment, who care about your spiritual well-being, who care about your health. They want to see your life change and your life transform. And so being in that right environment, being under the teaching and the feeding of the word of God, he says, will result in some powerful things. When you get fed the word of God, you will not fear. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. Faith is the opposite of fear. You can't have fear and faith at the same time. And so when you're being fed right, you'll not fear. And David said that because the Lord is my shepherd, I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death and not fear any evil. For your rod, which was symbolic of the word of God, will comfort me, will strengthen me, will will, will give me the faith that I need to get through every valley and every challenge and every circumstance in my life. He said, you'll not be dismayed. The word dismayed means to be shattered and broken and terrified. I've run across a lot of shattered and broken people lately. And I always tell a man, you know, we got a great church and great people, and I'd love for you to come and get involved. But I struggle because so many of these people, they can't be disciplined to make that commitment. And a couple weeks later, I'll see a post on social media about how that shattered, broken life even gets more shattered and more broken. And I keep saying, man, if you would just come. And again, it's not that church is the answer, but this is an awesome tool of God. And me as a shepherd, the heart to feed you and nourish you. So that that brokenness in your life can be put back together. So that that hurt in your life can be healed. So that the God of order can take that chaos in your life and bring order into your life. God wants to touch uh, so many people. And this was the heart of really our vision that Mateo was sharing this morning. Our our, our, Our vision is to change people's lives. And often the best way we know how to do that is for you to come and be committed and and disciplined to get into the word of God and get into the presence of God. And I'm here as a living testimony before you this morning to tell you it radically changed my life. And I know it was because of the presence of God and the word of God. And if you will be committed to those two things, it will radically change your life too. You can't have a half-hearted committed commitment to these things and expect to be shepherded. There were sheep that didn't want to be shepherded. Sheep that would run the fence line looking for a hole to get out. You ever see that picture of the Jesus uh, carrying a sheep on his shoulders? I'm told that, and we always look at that and go, oh, look at how he loved them. And I'm told that one of the practices of a shepherd was if they had a sheep that would constantly run away, that they would break one of their legs and put them over their shoulders and carry them back so they couldn't run away. And sometimes God's got to break us to keep us from running. Amen? The Lord is my shepherd. God sets up shepherds over us so that we won't be shattered and broken. And then he goes on and he says, and they won't lack. David tapped into that when he said, the Lord's my shepherd. He's all that I need. I lack nothing because of God and his involvement 
in my life. The Lord is my shepherd. We talked about that the first week, that it means that he owns me, that he's put his seal upon me, that, 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 that he has, has stamped me with his Holy Spirit. Who owns you? Who is your shepherd? Who owns your thoughts? Who owns your emotions? Who owns your time? Who is your shepherd? God needs to be at the center of our life and in control of our life, and he needs to be our life, not just a part of our life, but to be our life. So we talked about this progression, and last week we talked about the valley of the shadow of death as they were walking through the valley in the late spring to get into the early summer up into the mountain areas. And that's what he was talking about when he said, the valley of the shadow of death, and I'll fear no evil. And then we get to this verse, and he says, you'll prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. The area in the mountains that they went in the summertime to bring pasture to their sheep were called tablelands, the tablelands of the mountains. And so when David says that he'll, he'll prepare a table before me, I believe that this is talking about moving to the summer mountain table lands, to the table lands of the summer mountainous pastures and areas where a shepherd would lead their sheep. And as the sheep were winding through the valleys, the shepherd would often go before them to prepare these lands, to prepare their lands, the place, the pastures, and the place where they would live throughout the summer. And there were three things that the shepherd would do to get these lands ready for the sheep. The first thing he would do was he would go around and he would spread salt on the ground. Now, this is kind of interesting concept, but sheep need salt to survive. You need salt to survive. Salt, sodium is a very important element to our survival, but sheep in particular, they need salt. It was, uh, salt intake was a key to the health, health of the sheep. Without it, the sheep would die. And I, I thought about this, and I thought about how Jesus said that we are called the salt of the earth. Amen. That God has spread us around throughout the earth to be a, a, a source of health to other sheep and to the people in this world, that salt is a very important element. The second thing the shepherd would do is he would go around and he would look for signs of predators. He'd look for a paw prints and tracks to see if there were bears or cougars or lions. He'd look for snakes, although I'm, I'm told that uh, sheep are a very unique animal in the sense that snake bites uh, most of the time will not kill them. In fact, they use the blood of sheep for uh, anti-venom for snake bites. And so that's kind of an interesting thing, knowing that Satan is called the serpent and we are called God's sheep, that the Bible says the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, amen? But the shepherd would look for these things and different things that would be of any type of danger to the sheep. And the third thing he would do was he would look for different weeds that might be poisonous to the sheep. There were different plants that... Uh, Sheep would get very sick if they ate them and often die. And he would go and he would pull those weeds and get them out. And the shepherd would go before the sheep to prepare the way for them. I want you to know this morning that whatever it is that you're going through, your shepherd goes before you to prepare the way. Your shepherd has gone on ahead of you. You're not going into some place where you're going alone. In fact, not only will God leave you or forsake you, but he'll go ahead of you and he'll make a way where there seems to be no way. Amen. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 8, he says, do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Hallelujah. What a great God that we serve. He has a path established for you, and he'll go on ahead of you to remove anything that would destroy you, anything that would cause death in your life, anything that would hurt you or harm you. And it's so important that we follow the path of God, that we walk that path that he's established in our life. I was talking to somebody this week about the concept of predestination. There's a lot of people that think when they hear that phrase, predestination, that God has predetermined who will be a Christian, who will live in heaven, and who won't live in heaven. And that's not what I believe the Bible teaches. What God has done is he has predestined the path for you to walk in. He has predestined the plan for eternal life. But it's up to each and every one of us to walk in that path and to walk into that plan. Before the foundation of the world, God knew who you were. He knew your name. He saw your life, and he set out a path, and he went before you to prepare a way. But you have a choice to walk in that way and to walk in that path or to go a different way. 
But I want you to know that God has gone before you to prepare victory, to prepare something special, to prepare a blessing for you. And you won't receive that blessing. It's waiting down the path that you're walking because God has gone before you to prepare it for you. But if you don't walk that path, you'll never receive the blessing. He doesn't plan for you to stay in the valley. He's preparing your future blessing. You might be going through the valley of a job loss, through the valley of a relational struggle, through the valley of financial stress. Maybe you're going through a valley of of death, but he has prepared a victory feast for you. And if you'll follow him, you'll begin to find that victory. You'll begin to find the things that God wants you to feast on. He's prepared a table before you. A table land. Now, the table lands for the sheep were pastures, grass that they would feed on. And we often think of a table as something that we sit down and we eat at. And I think that's true as well. And it's something that maybe this past passage is, is symbolic of. But I want you to notice this morning, he says, he's prepared a table, number three, in the presence of my enemies. In the middle of my enemies. In the middle of my struggle. Enemies in the mountain, in the valley of the shadow of death, for us are many things. Maybe you're surrounded by discouragement, but God has set a table in front of you, and one of the things he's placed on the table for you to feed on is courage. I think of Joshua after Moses died, and three times God said, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous. He was walking through a valley of discouragement. He was walking through a valley where his thoughts were, I can't walk in Moses' is sure. I can't do it, Lord God. I'm not like Moses. I'm not strong enough. I'm not that kind of a leader. And God kept saying, in the midst of this valley of discouragement that you're walking in, that you don't think you can handle it, I have prepared a pot full of courage for you to feed on. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. In the midst of the valley, maybe you're walking through weakness and God has prepared strength. He said in his word, let the weak say, I am strong. And there's this big platter of strength that God has prepared for you to feed on in the midst of your weakness. He says, my strength will be made perfect in your weakness. Maybe you're struggling with confusion and God has given us direction. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on on your own understanding, but acknowledge the Lord. Walk in his path in everything that you do, and he will make those paths straight. In the midst of your confusion, there is some direction that God wants to lead you in in your life. In the midst of anxiety, he has comfort sitting on that table for you to feed on. In fact, the Holy Spirit is called our comforter, that God wants to strengthen and sustain you in the midst of your anxiety. Maybe in the midst of fear. Maybe you're feeding on fear this morning. Maybe you're surrounded by fear this morning, but he has prepared a table, and on that table is a big bowl full of his protection. He said, I'll give my angels charge over you. You won't even dash your foot against the stone, that you can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and not be afraid. God has given us protection to feed upon. Maybe you're struggling with lack this morning, bills to pay, facing foreclosure notices or or, or eviction notices, things like that. God has provision on this table for you, financial provision. The Bible says he's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. But I want you to know he's gone even beyond that. The Bible calls God El Shaddai, which we translate Almighty God, but literally it means that he's the God that is more than enough. He had 5,000 people on a hillside, and he wanted to feed them, and all he had was a little boy's lunch, some, some loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And he lifted those up, and he blessed them. And not only did they feed 5,000 people, But the 12 disciples that did the feeding, the Bible says they collected 12 basketfuls of leftovers. The people that dispersed the food got leftovers. They got fed too, 12 basketfuls. God is not a God of just hanging in there. God is not a God of just barely enough. God is not a God of just getting by. He is the God of more than enough. He is the God of leftovers. He is the God of abundance, and he wants to provide abundantly. If you come and sit down on his table, he's got abundance for you to feed upon in the midst of financial lack. He's a good God in the midst of doubt. I don't know if he's called us to be here. I don't know if he's called us to do this. He's a God of vision. 
And he's got all kinds of vision for you. And it's sitting on his table. But you've got to come and sit at the table of God. And the problem is that's not how we cope with things. In the midst of anxiety, in the midst of doubt, in the midst of fear, in the midst of bills to pay, in the midst of relationship problems, in the midst of all of this, I don't want to eat. I can't pray right now. I don't feel like going to church. I don't feel like worshiping. I'm too restless to eat. I'm too wound up to eat. That's not how you cope with the struggles of life. David says he's prepared a table before you in the presence of all of this stuff. And all you've got to do is be disciplined and and humble enough to sit down and begin to feed on the things that God has provided for you. Boy, that's good preaching, Pastor. I brought my own amens. I'll use them if I have to. God has prepared a table for you in the midst of every trial. And you know, one of the things in the Jewish culture of their time was sitting down and eating with someone was a, a big a sign and show of, of intimacy, not physical or sexual intimacy, but relationship, being close to a person. That if you really wanted to show how close a person was and how much they meant to you, you'd invite them over and you'd sit down at a table together and eat. And so feeding on these things, you may think, I've actually heard people say, I don't want to bother God. No, this is a sign of how close, how valuable your relationship with God is when you sit down at his table and begin to feed on his things. And I want you to know God's blessings are not based on the absence of enemies. He said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You know, there's a lot of people that think, I'll serve God when I get all this together. I'll serve God when when I get this straightened out. I'll serve God when I get through this struggle. God doesn't want you to serve him in the absence of your struggles. He's there for you in the midst of your struggles. There's a lot of people that they would define peace as the absence of struggle. And that's how the world defines peace. Uh, There used to be these bumper stickers back in my day that people would put on their car that said, pray for peace. And what they were saying was, we want to pray that there'll be no more struggle, no more conflict, no more war on the face of the earth. That's the world's definition of peace. But Jesus said these words in John chapter 14, verse 27. He said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The world's definition of peace is an absence of struggle, an absence of strife, an absence of problems. Jesus says, I can bring you peace right in the middle of your struggle, right in the middle of your problem. I've prepared a table before you in the presence of your enemies, in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. I've got peace for you to feed on. Hallelujah. With God, there's no need to be restless. There's no need to go without food. There's no need to go without the presence of God and the spiritual food. Even when all heck is breaking loose, you can sit and feast on his goodness, on his joy, on his peace, on his love, on his grace, on his mercy, on his favor, on his provision, on his healing in your life. Hallelujah. Man, I feel God here this morning. This is good stuff. He goes on, number four, he says, God anoints my head with oil. Now, the food that we're talking about is usually symbolic of the word of God. God gives us shepherds that will feed us. That's the word of God. Then he talks about he'll anoint my head with oil. Anybody know what oil is symbolic of? The presence of the Holy Spirit, right? These two things are so dynamic in the life of a believer. There's three reasons that a shepherd would apply oil to the head of a sheep. First of all is the sheep would get up to these tablelands in the mountains in the summertime. Summertime is a horrible time for flies. You know that, right? Many of you maybe have visited a farm and you see these horses just using their tail to swat flies and they look miserable everywhere. Well, sheep, they battled something very similar, but one of the things that they battled were called nose flies. And uh, these special kind of flies would get up into the nose of a sheep and they would lay eggs. And then the, the larva, did you have breakfast this morning yet? The larva from these would crawl up into their nasal cavity and just cause all kinds of havoc in a sheep's life. And sheep, they would, 
you know, find a tree to beat their head against or a post, just something to get some relief. They'd be so restless in this, trying to cope with these things that they wouldn't eat. And, you know, I find that we have a lot of terminology in our world that come from sheep. You know, we talk about, that's really bugging me. You talk about something bugging you, literally. This thing would really begin to bug them to the point that they would bang their head against something. And, you know, people say, I just feel like I'm banging my head against the wall. You're, you're a sheep. <laughs> Something's bugging you. But what the shepherd would do is they would find this oil, this ointment, and they would rub it on the nose, the face of the sheep. And it would not only kill those things, but it would keep the flies away. There is an anointing of the Holy Spirit that God wants to apply the balm of Gilead to your life to help you with those things that are pestering you, that are bugging you. The presence of the Holy Spirit, our comforter, is in our life to keep us from banging our head against the wall and the things that we struggle with in life. The second thing is sheep would battle something called scab in the summer. It's a skin disease that was caused by a small parasite. It was highly contagious. Uh, sheep would often kind of, they're very affectionate. They'd rub their heads together and and uh, rub noses against each other. And so if one of them caught scab, it would just begin to scatter throughout the whole flock. And, you know, again, we use phrases like, let's put our heads together. That's because you're sheep. That's what we do. We put our heads together. And soon that thing would kind of scatter around the flock. And, you know, one of the things that I've noticed when God describes sheep, it kind of reminds me of a lot of us because a lot of the problems with sheep were not huge lion bear-sized problems. They were these little flies, these little parasites that would get in and cause life miserable for them. And maybe uh, you don't struggle with big, huge, major things, but if we let a lot of little things begin to pile up and we get away from the presence of, of the table of God and the oil of the Holy Spirit of God, all those little things can really begin to eat away at our life after a while. And so we get very irritated when these little things are allowed to fester in our life. Scab was, I think, what was referred to when the Bible would talk about a lamb without spot or blemish. That was this disease called scab. And so God wants us to be lambs, sheep, without spot or blemish. And so the way that they would get rid of this scab was oftentimes if it just was contained to the face, they would rub oil, a special oil, on their faces, to, and it would kill the parasite. It would get rid of the scab. And sometimes it would be so bad they'd have to take the sheep and completely immerse them in oil. Well, that's another sermon for another day because God wants to immerse you in the Holy Spirit. We call it being baptized in the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. God wants to overwhelm you with his presence with the Holy Spirit, and it would heal these things. It would kill these things and keep it from spreading. Thirdly, summer was the time that breeding season would begin. And uh, the male, the rams in the flock, they would posture. They would begin to court some of the ewes, some of the women, you know, so that they could begin to breed with them. And one of the things that they would do, and you've seen this, is where these rams with their big horns, that they would just, man, butt heads. Again, that's another phrase we get from sheep. We've been butting heads. And, and they would just run at each other, trying to posture themselves, trying to win the affection of a, of a female. And uh, they would fight for those those ladies, those female sheep. And the shepherd would rub oil and ointment on their heads so that when they hit each other, it wouldn't uh, be such a difficult blow. They would kind of slide off of each other and it would keep them, the oil would keep them from hurting each other. You know, that's one thing I love about our church. The presence of the Holy Spirit is here on a regular basis. And it keeps our church absent from strife, from division, from gossip, from contentions, from the things that a lot of churches battle and struggle with. That, that When the presence of the oil is there, it keeps the sheep from butting heads with one another. You begin to walk in the love of God and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Boy, this is good stuff this morning. Finally today, I, I just want to wrap this up, and I really don't want to wrap it up, but our time is away from us. But I want to encourage you today to cope by accepting God's invitation to his table. You know, we see some of this in the New Testament even when Jesus went to a feast that he was invited to Simon's house and a woman came in and broke an alabaster flask and anointed his feet 
with oil. There was feasting and there was oil. These two things that would come together, the presence of the, the, the Word of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit are things that are so very important in our life. And I want to encourage you today to let the shepherd, not only the good shepherd, but this shepherd, apply the Holy Spirit to your life before you begin to feed on the Word. This is one of the reasons why we worship first. We want you, just like they would before they'd sit down to a meal, they would anoint each other with oil. We want you to worship, get in touch with the oil of the Holy Spirit to heal any irritation, anything that would try to steal the Word of God, that would keep you from sitting at the table of God and feasting on the things that you need from God. The presence of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God is such powerful things that God wants us to, to have as a, as a part of our life, not just on Sunday morning. You know, our Sundays are awesome and wonderful, but we're trying to set this up so you can do this all week long, trying to, you know, the shepherds wouldn't get down on their hands and knees and pick up the grass and always feed the sheep. They would show them where to eat. And so, you know, my goal on Sunday morning, yes, is to feed you, but it's also to show you where to eat so that you're feeding on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Our goal on Sunday morning is to show you how to worship so that you're worshiping on Thursday and Friday and Saturday because you don't just need this on Sunday. If you're like me, you need it all week long. But it takes faith. It takes faith to cope. It takes faith to sit down and eat in the midst of a battle, knowing that the Lord of hosts is taking you in and that everything will be taken care of. And so God is trying to take you in in the midst of your struggles and feed you and take care of you. But you've got to have the faith in the midst of the enemies, in the midst of the valley of the shadow, in the midst of every trial, you've got to, first of all, humble yourself because we all struggle to say, I got this, I can handle this. No, 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 you can't. You can't. You've got to humble yourself and say, God, thank you. You know, it's, it's humbling. We were over at somebody's house last night for dinner. It's humbling when somebody has made a, a meal for you and prepared it and they invite you, come sit down and let me serve you, let me feed you. That's humbling sometimes, especially for somebody like me because I love to serve people. But we've got to humble ourselves and admit, I, I can't do this. I need to sit down and let God feed me. And, and I imagine Jesus, you know, the one that, that, that gave the Holy Spirit for him to sit and let this woman put oil on his feet. How humbling that is to have somebody wash your feet. Sometimes we got to humble ourselves and go, Lord, I, I'm here to worship you. I need the oil of your Holy Spirit. I need your comfort. I, I can't do this in my own strength. I can't do this in my own ability. Lord, I need you. God, I'm here. You've invited me into your house to sit at your table, and I'm humbled and I'm honored, Lord God, and, and I'm going to feed on these things that you prepared for me because I need your strength and I need your word. It takes faith and humility. And I want to encourage you this morning, bow your head with me. But this is how we cope. We humble ourselves and we put our faith in God and we let him anoint us with the Holy Spirit and we let him invite us to his table and we feed on the things that he's prepared for us. That's what the Sabbath is all about. That's what Sundays are all about. It's God's time to pour into you. There's a time for you to pour out and to give, but then there's a time for you to sit and receive. Jesus said that man was not created for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. It, it, it's not your time to give, it's your time to receive. It's your time for God to pour into you. And I know we've got people serving in a lot of different ways, I, don't, don't misunderstand me. But even in our serving, sometimes God can pour into us. God wants to pour into you his oil in his word this morning, but you've got to humble yourself and exercise your faith and come sit at that table and feed on God today. Hallelujah. I'm just going to wait for a minute as God's speaking, I believe, to hearts. And some of you are, are realizing that you've been trying to do this yourself and you can't. Some of you need to just humble yourself. Just make an altar where you're at right now, sitting at your kitchen table on I see on the sofa in your family room right now, your desk at work. Just humble yourself right now. Just say, you know, I've been trying to do this in my own strength. And I'm shattered and I'm broken. 
and I, I, I'm not coping with it the way I should be. Put your faith in God right now. Humble yourself. Say this prayer with me. Say, God, I come to your table and I admit I can't do it. I need you. I confess that I put my confidence in something that's not right. And that's sin. I confess my sin today. I ask you to forgive me. And today, I give my life to you. In the midst of my enemies, I sit before your presence and I give my life to you. I want to serve you. I want to follow you. I commit to live for you from this day forward. Not to have you just a part of my life, but I want you to be my life. Come and live in me today. I want you to be my shepherd. I want to be your sheep. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Have you enjoyed this series? Amen. I know I have. Back in the day, I'd say, go buy the tape, but uh, you can't do that anymore, I guess. But uh, I think we've got one more installment in this. In October, we'll move into something a little bit different, but I'm excited. Don't forget, we've got a special announcement next week. You're going to want to be here for that. We've got some wonderful refreshments outside. Don't be in a hurry to leave today. Get a coffee, a water, a cookie. We've got some brownies left over from our men's dinner. Sorry, no steaks left over. I was sick. Guys thought I was joking. We had steak Friday night. It was a great dinner. Um, but bless you guys. Come back next week. Bring a friend with you. And let's keep building God's kingdom together.